good evening everybody i welcome you all in this one day international seminar of uh, india under pandemic impact and lessons learned this webinar is organized by economics department of herombo chandra college in association with in the internal quality assurance cell we know we are going through a very difficult time in history a uh, few days back we just learned that our economy shrunk by 23.9% as well as there is 6.4% 6.4 crore job loss so given this fact we have to understand that uh, how to proceed and for that we have two very eminent uh, academician and economists with us their deliberation will obviously enlighten us how to combat and overcome this situation so we are having with us today uh, dr shubhashish de of warwick university uk and dr bhaskar goshami of uh, bardwan university associate professor they will be enlightening us on the path forward i welcome them very heartily apart from that we are also having our principal dr nobonita chakraborty who is a very strong support in our endeavor and i also welcome uh, dr indrani mitro head of the department of economics herombo chandra college now uh, we are organizing this seminar on uh, youtube mainly the broadcasting will be taking place in youtube so all the participants who are there in the youtube i welcome all uh, first after the inaugural session dr dev will be making the deliberations and after the deliberations there will be question and answer session so i request all the participants who are watching over youtube channel our herombo chandra college youtube channel please post your comments and questions there we will be taking all the questions as much as possible and also uh, our speakers our eminent speakers will be uh, trying with trying their best to uh, address them once again i welcome all the delegates all the people who are present here as well as i welcome our speakers and now i request our principal dr nobonita chakraborty to say a few a few words to inaugurate the session madam ha madam please ask হেরমচন্দ্র কলেজের অর্থনীতি বিভাগে আয়োজিত আইকেসি সহযোগিতায় যে ওয়েবিনার আয়োজন করা হয়েছে আমি সেই ওয়েবিনারের কে সবাইকে আমি স্বাগত জানাই এবং ডক্টর ভাস্কর গোস্বামী এবং ডক্টর সুভাশিস দে তাদেরকে আমি ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছি আমি কলেজের পক্ষ থেকে যে তারা এই তাদের যে অমূল্য সময় সেই সময়টি তারা দিচ্ছেন আমাদের কলেজের এই অনুষ্ঠানের জন্য আজকে যে বিষয় নিয়ে এখানে আলোচনা হচ্ছে সেখানে অর্থনীতির কোনো জ্ঞান বা কোনো স্পর্ধা আমি এখানে দেখাতেই পারবো না এবং সেই সম্পর্কে আমি সম্পূর্ণই অজ্ঞ প্রিন্সিপাল অধ্যক্ষ সেগুলো কিন্তু এখন পুরোপুরি একটা অফিসিয়াল কাজ পড়াশুনো বা শিববিদ্যা চর্চার সঙ্গে প্রায় সম্পর্কহীন ফলে ওই নিয়ে আমি খুব কিছু বলবার চেষ্টা করব না তবে এটাও ঠিক যে আজকে যে অবস্থাটার মধ্যে আমরা এসে পড়েছি এই সমস্ত বিশ্ব জুড়ে যে অবস্থার মধ্যে এসে পড়েছি যে সেখানে আমাদের প্রচুর আমরা অনেক কিছু নতুন দেখছি এবং শিখছি এই যে লেসনস লার্ন বলে আমরা যে কত কি শিখলাম আমরা তো মাস্ক পরা শিখলাম আমরা হাত ধোয়া শিখলাম আমরা বাড়িতে থাকা শিখলাম আমাদের মতো কিছু ভবঘুরে মানুষ যারা বাইরে বেরোনোর জন্য সবসময় ব্যস্ত থাকে তারা ধৈর্য ধরে বাড়িতে থাকছে এগুলো শিখলাম কিন্তু তার সঙ্গে সঙ্গে আমরা এই বসে থাকতে থাকতে এও দেখছি যে সমস্ত জগতের সমস্ত সামাজিক যে অবস্থাটা সেটার কি অদ্ভুত একটা পরিবর্তন হয়ে যাচ্ছে এবং সেই পরিবর্তনের মধ্যে দিয়ে কত মানুষ কোথায় কে কোথায় ছিল কে কোথায় চলে যাচ্ছে এবং কি অবস্থা হয়ে যাচ্ছে এবং আজকে কোথাও আর কোনো উচ্চবিত্ত মধ্যবিত্ত নিম্নবিত্ত মনে হয় না যে তাদের কোথাও কোনো পার্থক্য হচ্ছে এই অবস্থার মধ্যে থেকে প্রত্যেকেই তারা কিন্তু ভীত সন্ত্রস্ত আতঙ্কিত এবং কেউই জানে না যে ভবিষ্যৎ কি কোথায় কেন এবং কোথায় গিয়ে যে শেষ হবে আর কোথা থেকে কোথা থেকে যে আবার আমরা নতুন করে শুরু করতে পারবো এই অনিশ্চিত একটা ভবিষ্যতের মধ্যে আমরা রয়েছি অর্থনীতির দিক থেকে 
তো খুবই অবস্থা আমরা যেটুকু সাধারণ মানুষ হিসেবে যেগুলো বুঝি যে সেটা সত্যিই তো খুবই করুণ অবস্থার মধ্যে চলে যাচ্ছে ভারতবর্ষ তো আরো অবস্থা খারাপ আমি সবাইকে শুভেচ্ছা জানাই এবং সবাইকে স্বাগত জানাই আমি আশা করি আজকের এই আলোচনা নিশ্চয়ই আমাদের সবাইকে সমৃদ্ধ করবে এবং প্রত্যেকে নিশ্চয়ই এই আলোচনার মাধ্যমে উপকৃত হবে আমি অনেক ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছি আমার ডাক্তার আবু সালাম যিনি আমাদের এই সমস্ত ওয়েবিনার গুলো অর্গানাইজ করতে ভীষণ ভাবে সাহায্য করছেন আর ধন্যবাদ ইকোনমিক্স ডিপার্টমেন্টকে যে তারা এত সুন্দর একটা অনুষ্ঠানের আয়োজন করতে চলেছে অনাংশু Thank you, ma'am, for your encouraging and uh, motivating words. Now, this is the time I must introduce the first speaker. So, let me introduce him. Our first speaker today is Dr. Shubhashish Dey. Dr. Shubhashish Dey is currently a senior teaching fellow in the Department of Economics at University of Warwick, UK. Before joining here, he was associate lecturer in the Economics Department of University of York. Before that, he was lecturer at the Faculty of Economics at the New College of Humanities, London. Dr. Day did his MSc in Economics from the University of Calcutta. After that, he did his second Master's in Development Studies from ISS, The Hague under Erasmus University, Rotterdam. Dr. Day completed his PhD in Economics from University of Manchester. There are multiple academic awards to his credit he received University level best teaching award at University of Manchester in 2015. He was also nominated Supervisor of the Year Award at University of York in 2018. His primary research interests are in the area of applied microeconomics, development economics, political economy, social protection and social policy, impact evaluation, etc. Being a vivid researcher, he has many national and international publications in reputed journal. Today, his topic will be. Does comprehensive lockdown affect containment of COVID-19? A developing country perspective. Uh, I welcome Dr. Day, Dr. Shubhashish Day. Please, Dr. Day, enlighten us by giving your presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Ayonangshu. We never call him Ayonangshu, you always call him Ayon. I mean, he is my friend since 1995. So we are, we studied the, uh, I'm audible yes, to all of you. Okay. So um, we studied together and not only in the undergraduate level, we did study together in the postgraduate level and we've been in touch mm -hmm. for uh, since 1995, since we completed our higher secondary exam and then started the same uh, college education for our undergraduate. So it's always a, a privilege to come back mm -hmm. with the old friends. And uh, I'm really thankful to the uh, Herombo Chandra College and particularly to the Department of Economics for giving me the opportunity to share my work, which I'm currently uh, working on. So we, with further uh, ado, I will just go to my presentation slides and uh, uh, to beginning, I should say that this is a work in progress, uh, and this is also a privilege. I'm privileged to announce also that the other speaker, Bhaskar, is also my classmate. So it's a kind of a reunion of the economics department Kata call. So Ayonangshu, the organizer, myself and Bhaskar, we were the same batch. We are the classmate uh, back 20 years back. So it's good to see all three known faces around. So I am straight uh, going to my presentation and just let me confirm if you guys can see the presentation slide. Is it uh, visible now? Is this slide is visible to all of you? Yes, it is visible. Okay, brilliant. So uh, this is a little twist in the title. Like a <laughs> flyer, it says that the, pro the title of the call, uh, talk will be on does comprehensive lockdown affect the uh, containment of the COVID spread. Uh, but um, I stick to the uh, working paper title, uh, which is uh, similar. I will, like, I, will, I will unpack the title in a minute or so. So, um, so it says that the decoding of comprehensive lockdown and a proposal for a strategic lockdown, right? So uh, 
you will see in a minute that what uh, we are trying to do. So once again, I would like to emphasize that this is a work in progress. So we have a couple of projects going on with my uh, students. So this is one of those projects which we are undergoing in related to the COVID uh, situation. So what I intend to deliver uh, through this presentation uh, the following question precisely. So does lockdown have any effect on the spread of COVID-19? Precisely uh, the prevalence of the COVID-19. So it is going to be a cross country study and in between I will particularly focus on India. So uh, as you can see the second point which I intend to deliver is how India is compared with the rest of the world in respect of stringency of lockdown. I will explain in a minute what do I mean by the stringency of lockdown and what has Indian lockdown delivered. And finally, I will end up with a proposal for strategic lockdown as against the total lockdown. So um, another, another uh, statutory um, statement right at the beginning that this is an empirical paper based on a cross country uh, data, uh, but our data started collecting in the uh, 13th of March and this study is based on uh, almost the third week of June. So it's a continuing project. So we are still uh, in the process of analyzing the recent data, but the primary present, uh, primary the empirical results that I am going to share here is based on 60 countries and in a span of a 13 weeks. So 60 countries over a 13 weeks period. So you can say that mid March to third week of June, most probably this is the period. Most of the countries, they have already already faced with their peak of the disease except India, Brazil and US. So, um, so this is the background context and in context of the 60 countries that we are considering here, uh, we have almost half of the countries are global north, which we call the developed countries and the half of the countries are global south, which are developing countries and we want to see that in respect of each of the questions, whether these developed and developed con developing countries has any heterogeneity in terms of response of this question. Precisely, we'll start with, does lockdown have any effect on the spread of COVID-19, right? So uh, what do we mean by the spread of COVID-19? Precisely uh, the, 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 the number of cases, right? So the number of COVID-19 cases, but when we are saying the number of COVID-19 cases, we really need to compare apple with apple, not apple with orange. So when we compare between countries, simply comparing the number of COVID cases will not be a scientific approach to compare simply looking at the number. So though in this uh, study, I am saying the numbers, basically this is the number of COVID uh, cases per uh, 1 million population. So if you randomly pick up the population of size one, 1 million, what is the prevalence of positive cases, right? So I will start with a very exploratory kind of a presentation. So uh, right at this moment, our question is, has lockdown, uh, has lockdown delivered anything in terms of the uh, combating the spread of COVID-19, right? So the, 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 the literature on epidemiology or literature on biostatistics, they are, they, are, they, are, they are remain inconclusive in respect of the following question, whether lockdown has anything to do in restricting the spread of COVID-19, right? The popular conjecture is that if you, uh, if you have a comprehensive lockdown, then you can really spread the, you, you can restrict the spread of COVID-19 by breaking the chain. That's the conventional wisdom. But does it really happening over the time across the world? So what's, this, what's the overall situation? So uh, we, we, we wanted to see this question looking at a cross-country uh, panel regression. So basically looking at that, uh, we want to see that how how this uh, lockdown measure varied across countries uh, and whether uh, that variation can explain anything in terms of the spread of the COVID-19 for those countries, right? So 
uh, we start with a, a interesting interesting uh, data analysis which was presented uh, a bit back in oxford uh, they are uh, they are saying that the lockdown stringency which is a basically a proxy measure of how strict a lockdown in respect of a country right so lockdown stringency is a composite index comprising of 20 indicators and this stringency index has its value from 0 to 100. Now, uh, uh, if anyone is particularly interested to know how this stringency index being constructed, I can navigate those person to read the Oxford uh, literature at Blavitic uh, Public School. They constructed based on each and every dimension of the lockdown precisely let's say whether all school were open versus all school were closed whether there was any uh, cultural events going on so like that 20 indicators based on each indicator runs from 0 to 10 sorry and 10 being the uh, the strictest measure and 0 being the uh, no measure and based on that overall they constructed a uh, index that is called the stringency index, how stringent the lockdown was for a particular country. If the stringency index takes the value 100, then we would say that the country is experiencing the strictest kind of a lockdown. So a stringency value can take maximum value 100, which says that the country is experiencing the most strict form of lockdown. And if it is zero, then that shows that country is not experiencing any lockdown at all at all so during during the uh, i mean the at the time of end of our survey which was the third week of june the uh, the country which was experiencing the world most strict form of lockdown was india for india the stringency index value was 97.3 97.3 was the value of stringency for India, which shows that during that period of time, starting from the uh, March to uh, almost the end of June, across the world, India had experienced a most strict form of lockdown. Now, that does not mean that people obeyed the lockdown. The stringency is more or less in terms of the uh, the government imposed conditionality, right? So they also developed an, another alternative index called the governance response, but that is a bit debatable. But people in liter in, in cur currently the people who are working on a cross country studies, there is a sort of a consensus that the stringency of lockdown is a good proxy for a strictness of lockdown. Now, uh, in the in this particular picture, which you can see in the extreme left upper panel in the vertical axis each dot represents a country so if you randomly pick up one dot then the horizontal coordinate shows the number of covid cases per million of population and in the vertical axis you can see the value of stringency index right and then uh, apparently based on a simple exploratory analysis like i mean they wanted to plot the scattered plot and from there they wanted to construct a best fit line and you can see the best fit line is almost horizontal what does this mean from a statistical point of view and as an economist what i should infer from this horizontal line which is plotted against the stringency index and number of covid cases that shows that uh, for a given for a given level of stringency level you may have a wide variety of positive number of cases. So that means uh, even if you keep your stringency level constant, let's say at the level of 85 of stringency index, you may experience a wide variety of number of positive cases. So that saying so, that means the lockdown stringency has apparently no significant impact on the number of positive COVID cases, right? So the kind of inference, which is a inference is not any causal relation. It's simply uh, plotting the exploratory analysis, trying to see that how far the stringency can explain uh, the, the spread of COVID cases. And uh, it shows that 
uh, even if the number of cases changes, if you move from the left in the horizontal axis from left to right, that means your number of COVID cases increases, but you may experience the same level of stringency for those different level of COVID cases across the country. So simply plotting a two-way plot, the best fit line suggest apparently that the lockdown stringency has no significant impact on number of posit positive COVID cases. So is it a really something credible uh, inference to draw? Because this is not a multivariate, this is not a, even a, a multivariate correlation analysis or neither a causal analysis. We really don't know, uh, but simply starting with that. Now, as against this world picture, so 66 countries data, which I plotted in the extreme left upper panel, I just want to see how in Indian context, this lockdown measures has uh, changes. So if you, I mean, um, uh, we worked on a data set, uh, the, you can see the three vertical red line shows the time period of the lockdown, lockdown one, lockdown two, and lockdown three. The blue line, which is almost a horizontal line, which shows the case fatality rate, uh, which is basically the wide, uh, widely accepted measure of how uh, bad this disease is comparable to the other disease. So basically, case fatality rate defined by number of deaths divided by number of positive cases. So that means out of 100 uh, positive cases, what is the percentage of people who eventually experience, I mean, uh, they unfortunately died, that is 3.35. But this is to remember that this is neither case, sorry, age adjusted, nor uh, adjusted by uh, across the country. Simply looking at India, we can say that uh, between the lockdown period, right, lockdown one to lockdown two to lockdown three, as we progress from week after week after week after week, the CFR, the, uh, the case fatality rate, uh, remain almost uh, constant. If I, I will show in a minute the, what is the comparable case fatality rate uh, in the other countries, whereas in India it's 3.35 uh, for Italy, for Spain, for Greece, for Belgium, all the West European countries, such fatality rate was something above 10, above 10 during the same comparable period, right? So on the contrary, on the contrary, for those countries as well, they have had the similar measure of lockdown. So if we say that the lockdown stringency in India, as well as the Western European countries were same in magnitude, but both the countries are experiencing different case fatality rate. So in that sense, if someone is asking me, the, can the lockdown deliver anything in terms of restricting or explaining the case fatality rate, then we cannot, we will remain inconclusive as we remain inconclusive in respect of the, uh, the number of positive cases. So this slide is essentially taking the following conclusion not, no, I mean, kind of a conclusion is basically saying that based on an exploratory analysis across the countries and within India, we are not getting any, any evidence that lockdown measured in terms of a stringency index has delivered anything in terms of restricting the spread of positive cases and nor restricting or uh, reducing the case fatality rate, right? So... Now I am presenting a bit of a numbers because we economists love numbers and I am particularly an empirical economist, so I deal with the number. So this is a kind of a more, uh, more uh, confirmatory analysis as against the previous slide was mostly the exploratory analysis. This is a sort of a cross-country panel regression results based on 11th March to 9th June 13 weeks data point for 60 countries, among which 34 countries were developed countries and 26 countries were the developing countries. Now, you, our outcome variable, or in, in those who are a bit familiar with the regression analysis, our Y variable here is the number of cases per million. So number of positive cases per million, which is sort of a comparable outcome variable across the country. 
now we control not only the 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 stringency but we now control many other covariates and then try to see that again the stringency has remained inconclusive in explaining the positive uh, spread of the disease so the fast control variable we have the new test or nt per week so new weekly test per thousand population right and then the nt square number of tests square and then the si which is a two period lagged value of the stringency index the idea is that if you if you impose a strict lockdown today then you you if if that has any impact on controlling the spread of the virus then that should have an effect in two weeks time because today's lockdown must not i mean it can't can't affect if any uh, today's uh, positive numbers because if you restrict today that will manifest in a lagged manner so that's why we took a two period lagged value of stringency index and then we took a interaction term of the test capacity nt and stringency index si as measures with the lagged values and then we have set of controls uh, which is a country specific control and we have a country fixed effect and then what does this result says so the result says which is similar with the other emerging studies that uh, the test, capa test capacity has a positive relation with the number of prevalence. So basically, uh, this is quite obvious that during this period of 11th March to 13th June, uh, during that period, if you keep on increasing your test capacity, you are bound to have more positive cases. So therefore, there are positive significant coefficient is not something surprising to get that more tests will end up with getting more positive number of cases, right? That's fine. But do you really expect that the, if you keep on increasing your test capacity, you will keep on getting a positive number increasing over time? What do you expect? If you really if you really restrict the spread of the virus after a certain point of time, there has to be a plateau. So if you keep on increasing your test, your positive number increases, 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 but surrounding controlling factors uh, is also contributing in combating the disease. Then after a certain point of time, even if you increase your number of tests per week, your number of positive new cases is bound to fall. So therefore, that is reflected in terms of the square term. So the, there, there has to be a non-linearity. If you plot in the horizontal axis, if you plot in the horizontal axis, the number of tests per week, and in the vertical axis, if you plot the number of positive cases per million, then there will be an inverted U-shaped car, which is clearly evident from this fast two coefficient of this cross country regressions right so you get a positive coefficient of test meaning if you increase your test the number of positive cases will increase then you reach a peak and then it will count bound to fall so there is a point of inflection and from onwards the curvature changes and that is reflected by the square component of your regression so the fast two covariates are perfectly okay with the emerging literature in economics, in uh, uh, epidemiology, in biostatistics, there is a consensus of the sign and significance of the fast two covariates. But the interesting point, and from where our paper is going to contribute, basically, I mean, <coughs> what we are getting so far, based on an exploratory analysis as well as a confirmatory analysis, uh, our initial initial findings were suggesting that stringency might not have any impact in combating the disease so that was kind of an apprehension with that apprehension in the background we went to run the regression based on a 60 countries over a 13 weeks period and then look at the stringency index coefficient for a pooled sample of 60 countries it appears to be positive insignificant positive insignificant that means if you don't pay attention on the developed versus developing countries, if you simply look at the world on an average, then you tend to find that stringency really has nothing to do in explaining uh, explaining the variation in the number of positive cases of COVID. Uh, COVID. 
So that's why we get a statistically insignificant coefficient of SI with a lag two for the pool sample. But what about once you once you once you subdivide the sample into developed and developing countries? There is interesting stuff, and I think that is going to be the something very, I mean, very interesting results, and which can contribute uh, in the entire emerging literature is that following bits. So once we divided the country between 34 developing countries and th 34 developed countries and 30, 26 uh, developing countries with a 13-week th period, you can see that the stringency has indeed has a negative impact in combating the spread of the disease for the developed countries. So once you look at the West European countries where I am currently sitting now, in this country setup, a stringency, which is a measure of a lockdown, has indeed an effect in reducing the number of COVID cases or COVID spread, right? But surprisingly, surprisingly, look at the developing countries' coefficient, which is not only positive, but that is that is something significant as well. Meaning that, I mean, with a with an objective of reducing the com with an objective of reducing the spread of COVID-19 and thereby reducing the number of positive cases, the government in the developing countries, i.e. India, Brazil, or, 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 or Southern Hemispherean countries, or Global South countries, they introduced a strict form of lockdown, but that eventually manifested in terms of a positive, uh, in a sense that strict lockdown actually counterproductive. The strict lockdown appears to be counterproductive when we look at the subsample with the developing countries, right? So the obvious question would come that why this is so? That I will address later on, but at least simply looking at a data science point of view, what these interesting findings is coming out that when we look at the developed country perspective, stringency for a period of 13 weeks, indeed, as you move from a less strict lockdown to the more strict lockdown, it has indeed a desired effect in reducing the uh, number of positive cases. Remember, I am talking about positive cases. I haven't introduced anything on the case fatality, right? So that has an impact. But for a uh, developing country, for example, India, it is not only remain inconclusive, it is rather uh, uh, is counterproductive. But what about the interaction term? So interaction term, which is NT interacted with SI, that means test capacity and stringency, that has consistently a negative coefficient, meaning, meaning the following. Like this is not the stringency per se, which can contribute in a desired way to combating the disease. It is the test capacity along with stringency can explain things better than the stringency itself. Right. So, so I will I will show in a minute that how India were lagging behind uh, in a many fold, lagging behind in many fold with a comparable countries in terms of its test capacity. So, without the test capacity, one fine evening at 8 p.m., if you start declaring the stringency, that has nothing to do in terms of the combating the disease other than a kind of a kind of a popular drama, right? That one could say. So, uh, I mean, the previous slide, which appears to be fairly horizontal in the top left corner, is appear to be uh, more meaningful when we look at this uh, pool sample of statistical insignificant, but a positive statistical significance of the stringency. So one could conclude from this particular slide is the following conclusion. So for a developing country context, Stringency by its own is counterproductive unless the stringency, which is a proxy measure of lockdown, is coupled with is coupled with a, a very aggressive form of testing capacity. Stringency by its own cannot deliver anything at all uh, in combating the disease or in combating the spread of COVID-19. That's the first kind of a very conclusive evidence which we are getting from our exploratory analysis as well as a confirmatory analysis uh, is saying that stringency by its own, simply, simply putting the lockdown in place 
and allowing the entire informal sector to decide their own fate by their own is becoming counterproductive. And, and we can have a lots of anecdotes around this positive coefficient of stringency along the developing countries. Like once you don't you have a safety net set up, once you don't have any uh, proper uh, financial packages in place, once you don't have any organized sector uh, 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 in a significant sec section is not organized, then simply introduction of lockdown is actually creating a chaos and that would, that would end up with what we have seen in the initial period of lockdown. Thousands and thousands and thousands uh, informal sector workers, they come out from their work working place and then there is a great mix of chaos and that has contributed in a many more many fold more in uh, spreading the disease than combating the disease and which is clearly evident from a positive significant coefficient of SI in the developing country context. But when this SI is coupled with a, a, a aggressive form of testing that indeed has an effect on combating the disease. So that's the first part. Now I would show you that, uh, that how India is compared with the rest of the world in respect of tendency of lockdown. So I just picked up a bits of uh, countries which are recently compared with India is South Africa, China, Brazil, India, US, UK, and Germany. And the top purple line, if you can see, the top purple line is basically uh, the graph for the stringency value of the India. You can see from the almost in the second, uh, the mid of March uh, to end of April or, 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 or early, early June, India have experienced, India had experienced the world most strictest form of lockdown. We did not do anything else other than putting lockdown in place. We thought, that the lockdown would end up with combating the disease, but it did not. It did not because we during that period of time, the India never uh, uh, had uh, any kind of a comprehensive financial package. There was no huge investment of building of the health infrastructure capacity. There was no testing capacity nowhere near the comparable country. I will show in a minute. Even some of the African countries were doing much better than India in terms of the testing capacity uh, during the same period of time. But what we did, we locked down. And that, that appears to be counterproductive, right? So what has Indian lockdown? So the previous two slides were a macro picture across the world. And then we sliced that macro picture into developed and developing countries. Now I really want to show that what is actually happening, we already showed that over the period of time, the case fatality remained uh, remained uh, fairly constant, and the case doubling rate slowed down. Initially, it was it was doubling in three, four, six days, but later on, it was in fourteen days. So the doubling rate has, but still, we we kept on, we kept on. Uh, increasing the stringency of lockdown from phase one to phase two to phase three, right? So uh, this is also uh, to make uh, to make the audience um, uh, our results more convincing that what was uh, the, the 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 test per million uh, test per million uh, uh, up to the point when we 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 we, we managed to cal calculate this uh, data. So the countries, let's say, look at uh, look at Russia, Spain, United Kingdom. Uh, the test per million in the first first ten weeks, the average test per million in US was fifty thousand. Uh, Russia was sixty eight thousand. Spain was seventy six thousand, and India was two thousand. India was two thousand, right? So in comparison to the other countries, so now you can say that these are the developed countries. These are the developed countries. So you simply cannot compare apple with orange. So you India cannot be compared with US or Spain or United Kingdom or France and Germany, etc. OK, hang on a moment. I will show you some comparable countries tests per million as well. So, uh, the, so the point to take here is that the, um, that, uh, uh, the next slide. Yes. So this is a kind of a, you don't need to read, just 
try to get a visual impression the top in the in the upper panel two 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 uh, two uh, green line is saying this is a graph which shows that uh, another measure of testing capacity which is what so the 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 emerging literature are measuring testing capacity broadly in three way three way one is simple number of tests per million that is i just showed and in terms of that india is lagging the the another another most widely and it's a comparable uh, measurement is that how many tests you conducted to trace one positive case so how many tests test it's called the testing speed so this is one of the most or one of the widely accepted uh, a measure of testing uh, speed which says that to get one positive case how many tests you have conducted now see in the first 10 weeks of the spread from mid march to following 10 weeks when vietnam vietnam just look at the vietnam were conducting 785 785 i repeat 785 tests for par positive case india was india was doing 23 tests so india what india was doing in the initial week they just went into the con the containment zone or, or or red zone and they conduct tests and if you if you go in a red zone and if you conduct 50 tests you bound to get almost half as a positive case but if your test capacity is widely uh, increased if your test capacity is huge then you can go randomly any places and therefore par positive case number of tests is bound to increase so vietnam taiwan new zealand australia south korea south africa czech republic estonia these are the countries who are conducting more than 100 more than 100 in fact the vietnam was 700 number of tests to get one positive case in that same period india was conducting only 23 now this four panel is showing by the end of 25th march by end of 25th april by the end of 25th may and by the end of june 3 so by that time many country has picked up their test capacity and reached to the higher ladder in terms of this testing indicator but india has still remained in the uh, in the capacity of 20 so here is the 20 it's saying that even after two months three months the number of tests conducted to trace out one positive case still remain 20 when some other countries reach to many fold more so this is an another another um, uh, interesting uh, interesting graph so basically if you if you zoom uh, out your vision then you can see this is a sort of a positively sloped kind of a line right so here in the vertical axis we are conduct we are plotting the test per thousand and in the horizontal axis we are plotting gdp per capita in 2017 scale so all these slides are presenting here to convince that how bad india was in terms of its test capacity this is another another example so the red dot if you can see this red dot is the india here and in the horizontal axis we are plotting gdp per capita so as you move from left to right your gdp per capita in 2017 scale is increasing right so you become more rich once you move from left to right but in the vertical axis if you move from the bottom to up that means your test capacity is increasing right so you can see there is a chunk of countries in the northeast corner that means they had a higher gdp and they had also a higher testing capacity as well right so which is quite obvious so you can see this the northeast corner of cluster of countries are denmark ireland belgium switzerland that's fine but look at look at the countries like rwanda which is one of the uh, one of the poorest country in african subcontinent el salvador in a latin american country nepal they if you see the rwanda this is rwanda sorry sorry so this is this is this is rwanda 
which has much, much, much lower GDP per capita, but it even has a higher total number of tests per thousand population. So Rwanda, Nepal, El Salvador, Ukraine, they are a poorer country than India, but even they had a higher test uh, in terms of the test capacity, right? So now, so the point to take here from is that uh, we have we have said two important conclusions to draw from this presentation up to now. One is based on exploratory analysis and as well as confirmatory analysis, based on a cross-country pool regression, based on a developed developing country pool regressions, we concluded that the stringency by its own has nothing to do in terms of combating the spread of the disease unless unless the test capacity increases in a manifold manner what had happened in indian context which we are experiencing now that india had a strictest form of lockdown in fact the world strictest form of lockdown but it never had a comparable good testing capacity in somewhat in a sense that it is even worse than countries like rwanda nepal el salvador and countries like that so therefore the Indian lockdown is something like a counterproductive lockdown, right? Now, I just wanted to say something a bit different. So what is, what is that bit different? Do we really need to panic for what we are experiencing via COVID? Like, is COVID is, is a more of a hive or is it indeed a, 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 a really a fatal, fatal phenomenon, right? So once we, we, are, we, once we are saying that, the case fatality rate for the COVID is 3.3, uh, something around that. Uh, what is the comparable case fatality rate for the comparable disease? So the, the obvious comparable uh, disease, disease which is, is the annual flu, annual flu, which has a case fatality as per the, as per the center of uh, disease control, CDC in US is 0 0.15. Now I just showed you that the case fatality rate for India uh, in the in the initial months was above three, but that was not age adjusted. What is the age adjusted uh, case fatality? Now you can see in the extreme top left, uh, we we split the age graph, age 80 plus year old and 70 to 79 and hence so on, and you can see that the case fatality or death rate, case fatality or death rate is 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 disproportionately high for the older population but it is it is quite low like if you simply look at the working age population which is basically 20 to let's say 50 or even 20 to 50 is actually less than one person right so so india's age adjusted age adjusted uh, case fatality rate as we calculated is 2.25 as against what is reported by ICMR 3.35. So comment to draw from here is the following. So uh, which is also also discussed by widely circulated recent working paper by Debraj Rai and Subramaniam. They claim that we really need to think, we really need to think that if there is no comprehensive lockdown for the seasonal flu with a case fatality rate of 0.1, then why there would be such a draconian lockdown with 0.2 case fatality rate for COVID for the working age population? Because, because we are concerned about, I mean, then one obvious question would be that, do you, do you really not paying attention to the death of the older population? I will come to that point later. But the point here, I am saying that for the population group 20 to 50, the case fatality rate is 0 0.2 as against 0 0.1 for the seasonal flu. Now, the question one could ask that if there is no lockdown at all for seasonal flu with the case fatality rate 0 0.1, then why such a draconian lockdown with without the absence of uh, supporting system, is, uh, there is a draconian lockdown? So that is an obvious question one could ask. Then another point which uh, we are raising that that uh, is is COVID death is more visible than the invisible death. So there is a political economic question that are we really uh, shouting much around the COVID death 
basically my point as an economist uh, where i belong that i i seriously uh, i mean put my argument uh, against the uh, comprehensive leg lockdown what the kind india has experienced so i am saying that the number of accident related death in india was about 151000 like uh, something around 1 lakh 51000 in 2018 uh, which saw which saw a 2.3 percent increase in the compared death compared to 2017 death due to snake bites in india is estimated around 50000 every year death due to rabies virus due to the dog bites in around 20000 death due to malaria is 10000 all sources are mentioned here so this these deaths could have been avoided could have been avoided if you really say for the sake of a uh, uh, argument then we can say that if you were at home completely locked down then you would not experience an accident right you would not probably have a snake bite if you can lock yourself in a room right uh, maybe malaria could be so this death could have been avoided through a complete lockdown so that's why the ray and subramaniam they are saying that that uh, uh, uh that uh, this this largely remain uh, this death largely remain invisible in the sense uh, that is diffusing 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 under the visible death of covid right so now uh, uh, i mean we have some interesting uh, interesting observations which bit provocative in the nature that uh what is in my view in our view uh, the kind of a lockdown that india has imposed is a kind of a political response in a in a in a situation when uh, the indian government could not tackle this pandemic by introducing or increasing the health infrastructure capacity or other economic measurement you put the lockdown that was the most easiest form of steps that india could taken and and hence they did that so lockdown can never be a long term strategy rather it is only a suppression strategy to buy some extremely costly time to build and revamp the public health infrastructure india did not see major improvement in health infrastructure or hospital during the lockdown period like other western countries in fact only only 1500 15000 crore so 15000 crore from 20 lakh crore financial package which is called the atmanirbhar uh, which is less than 0.75% declared by the prime minister has been allocated to the uh, health infrastructure sector so instead of ensuring revamping the health in facilities much effort was dedicated in maintaining the lockdown i have a recent paper in uh, uh, with anirban kundu from presidency college bengaluru and myself Uh, we have written a piece in ideas for india uh, atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan putting the cart before the horse so we uh, it is a relatively long article we actually scrutinize and eventually find that that was a big jumla type of a, uh, a package and uh, which eventually have little less than 1% of gdp which india claimed as around 10% right so so eventually what we are trying to propose here is the following right based on our empirical study cross country and the indian experience what we are proposing is the following so that is the strategic lockdown right if india ever experience a second second order pandemic in future as an economist our proposal will be the following right keeping in mind that we have by this time established using a cross country data and developing country data and indian data that stringency of lockdown which was a proxy for the lockdown measurement has has not delivered anything in combating the disease by itself by itself right so what is a strategic lockdown we are proposing for a strategic lockdown as against the comprehensive total lockdown one can think of a strategic lockdown by shielding the elderly and vulnerable allowing others to work uh, so that we can ensure that the economy keeps moving right so government could have invested big chunk of money in building the makeshift infrastructures like temporary care home community centers 
incentivizing household decision making towards an affecting shielding policy, which is basically could insulate elderly and vulnerable population. We would call this shielding strategy as a strategic lockdown as against the total lockdown. In a cost benefit analysis, the cost of building this infrastructure and monitoring might be manifold lesser than the cost of total lockdown, which is unsurprisingly appearing to be synonymous to total unlockdown. So what we call the Indian lockdown as a fiasco of Indian unlockdown, right? So we are actually proposing for strategic lockdown and we have some evidence in favor of that, right? So that is the precisely uh, that my paper is trying to contribute or conclude at the end that we eventually require a strategic lockdown in the form of a shielding which I which I explain uh, in 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 detail in our paper, but our paper has two part: one, an empirical findings, and then some policy prescription. And eventually, I have made a Bengali piece, which is written in this blog. If anyone interested to read more about uh, uh, about our presentation and our paper in Bengali particularly, so I will encourage you all to see my Bangla blog, which is called Binirman. And I will stop here and I will, I will, I will, I mean, let the audience to ask question now onwards. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Subhashish. Can you hear me, please? I can hear you. Thank you, Subhashish, for such a beautiful presentations. And uh, we believe that uh, what you believe has solid mathematical background as well as factual background. Now, there are some questions. Let me. Uh, let me read out those questions for you. Uh, one question is from Oyonaho Noshkar. He is asking, uh, okay, it's acceptable that in the developing country, developing country like India, maybe the lockdown doesn't have any positive effect on COVID-19. And that really means that lockdown process is totally a wrong way. Is lockdown process totally a wrong way? Yeah, I think in the last slide, I mentioned that the way India has done, that is, in our opinion, is, is, is counterproductive, clearly. So what we are proposing, instead of a lo complete lockdown or comprehensive lockdown, which means as we experience in India, as we have experience in India, we are proposing for a strategic lockdown. The meaning is that we have to deploy some sort of a strategy, which I highlighted also, that what should be that strategy that is a shielding and makeshift arrangement. So we have to shield, we have to shield the older and the vulnerable population. And we should let, we should let, I repeat, we should let the working age population to move freely to keep the economy moving. And we have presented an evidence beside that, that if you really let the young people to work then the case fatality rate, as it suggests, would be around 0.2% as against the annual flu, which has a 0.1% of uh, case fatality. Yeah, and, but, but one could say that this is, is, is I mean, uh, the, the COVID is less, I mean, I mean, much, much less virulent among the young uh, uh, population than the older and vulnerable population. But in terms of the infectivity, indeed, it has a, a higher infection, but that infection is, um, is not eventually turns into a fatality at the end. And hence, our proposal would be no complete lockdown, rather strategic lockdown. You are, you are muted, Ion. Thank you, Shubhashi. Uh, there is another question uh, from Professor Abdul Hadi. Now, every day above 80,000 people have been affecting by Corona. That means India is failure to control spreading of Corona. For this situation, how much is central government responsible? Yeah, this is an interesting question, but our study is not that focusing in that particular part. Uh, I mean, of course, in a democratic setup, the government has to take the responsibility. When there is a success story, that government takes the success story. If there is a failure story, government has to own that failure story. You simply cannot say that people are not obeying this lockdown, people are not wearing the mask. But 
people are always guided by their hard behavior hard behavior so now is the, is the policy maker uh, who 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 needs to uh, 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 I, mean, I mean provide the counseling support to the government and government is the ultimate responsible agent uh, who should take the responsibility if there is any failure for that particular question i would say that of course the central government is 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 highly responsible uh, if not the entirely responsible for the current situation what is india is experiencing and i will encourage you uh, to read that ideas for india article where i mentioned that how the other comparable country they did in building up the health infrastructure during the lockdown period what india did not do even till now thank you so much obviously i will go through that i haven't gone through that there are a few more question rituparna chatterjee asked how is it possible to build prompt infrastructure initially as you have said that a uh, significant amount of expenditure should have been channelized to the development of the uh, health system and infrastructure so the question is there how it is possible to build prompt infrastructure facility so basically i mean uh, again we have some good experience like the the, the world uh, largest uh, i mean it has uh, we have seen uh, some interesting interesting uh, cases not only in developed countries in kerala uh, we have seen that how the community centers are transformed into a covid hospital in the care center and uh, so my concern i am not an epidemiologist i am not a medical person i am an economist and uh, I, i i mean i compare lives over lives i am not comparing lives over livelihood normally the non economists are criticized on a point that the economists are always compare lives versus livelihood but i consider that livelihood eventually turns into lives as well so eventually economists are also comparing lives versus lives so the infrastructures initial infrastructure is what we experience so far we have to keep our elderly and vulnerable population by vulnerable we mean the people who have uh, reduced immunity power like the pension, cancer patient or diabetic patient or kidney uh, deformity patient so they are the impaired immunity patient we have to keep them safe uh, and we have to shield them we have to shield shield them like the Uh, the, in, in, instead of a building an infrastructure we can if we have a database like who are these elderly population we can incentivize the household who are having proportionately higher older population uh, we can incentivize the household to keep their older population uh, shielded right that has happened in germany uh, like you will give some uh, uh, vouchers or, or token money that if you keep your older population inside and you will penalize if you keep your older population out but completely locked down meaning you are because there is no safety net safety net setup like the country where we are sitting here 80% of the salaried person they continue to earn their salary even when their farm was closed because government followed uh, that means government paid kept on paying their salary from government coffer but india cannot have that uh, scope cannot ex- ca- cannot have that financial capacity to provide everyone salary even if a private sector employer uh, uh, shut down uh, his or her, her company you cannot do that but you can do some strategic involvement where you can shield your elderly and vulnerable population and regarding the infrastructure we have seen that how election is conducted in indian context which is a surprising factor in world audience that india is organizing the uh, uh, election that is that has to be in an in an war mode why don't we convert our public sectors infrastructures like stadium or all other community center as a makeshift uh, hospital why it took so much long time that india will procure so these are the policy questions i mean I, our paper is not focusing on that but our paper is primarily contributing by com- bringing out a scientific analysis of uh, of the question that whether the uh, lockdown has delivered anything in terms of combating the disease the answer is no and more particularly for india that's the main contribution infrastructures how it can be developed so quickly uh, there is a different research questions i have answer for that but this paper is particularly not paying attention on that 
question precisely. Exactly. Uh, Dr. Sh uh, Professor Shubhashish Dashgupta asked the same question. I think Shubhashish has got the answer. He has also asked about the infrastructure only. The next question is from Dr. Indrani Mitro. Since it is a contagious disease, as transport and health facilities are insufficient for the poor, how government can open the economy? As it is a contagious disease and transport facilities are insufficient, and also health, health facilities are insufficient for an economy like India, how government can open the, open the economy, given the poor are the vulnerable one? Uh, that is the question. No, the question is like, do, do you have any counter uh, factual evidence that if, I mean, everything is a predicted model. My point is that I already answered that one could say that if you were in a lot, all the all last previous years, people who were experiencing a lockdown, then they could have saved their life a, 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 through accident. Now one could say that accident is not a contagious disease. My point is also that it's a contagious disease, but it's not a, as virulent as, let's say, the other disease like uh, Ebola. Ebola had a case fatality rate like 86%. 86% case fatality rate, but it has a case fatality for a comparable working age population is 0 0.2 as against 0 0.1. People, if they get like most of the people are asymptomatic, and even if you catch the virus, uh, uh, most of the people they will get cured once they are still at home. But as there is a good number of people who will eventually die because of this elderly or low low Im immunity, these things makes this disease so 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 noisy. The point is that uh, I mean. Uh, government has to incentivize the household how they could uh, shield their elder population and allow the younger population to work so one one like if if we cons consider consider a middle class household in urban settings where they have a two toilets and a two floor then it's quite easy but not maybe five percent population or maybe two percent populations they have two toilets but what would be the concept? Con we've been asked these questions. Like, how can you expect that the older people will remain in a one room and the younger people will remain in a other room and they will work? But in a one room, when they will go and come back, that are the policy questions because government has to set up a community center. I propose in this bigger writing that what could be the policy steps one could take to shield the older population? Because if you allow the younger population, there will be a con disease will spread from one to other, but it will not be as virulent as it would have with the older population. That's my point. Because shutting down the economy, you are creating a larger cost than locking the economy and saving people from the COVID. That's my point. Exactly. And taking your cue, ma'am has actually asked one more thing, that what is your plan to actually protect uh, the interest of these poor who are the vulnerable ones. Again, so that point is, I said that the grand strategy is called the shielding strategy. Shielding means you have to shield your older population for, for, with, with, with the contacts of the younger and working age populations within the same household. If you have that infrastructure, you should exploit that. Otherwise, government should come up with some plan. One plan could be, one plan could be like, as a behavior, I mean, if from a behavioral economist point of view, you could say that you can incentivize the household member, young household member, to protect their older population by incentivizing them. Like when a younger working age population mem mem member of a household see that if I can effectively shield my older population, then I would get some incentive for the government, then the incentive compatibility will force the households individual to shield their elder populations inside the household. If not possible, then government has to come up with some makeshift arrangement by building community infrastructures in a neighborhood. That has happened in Latin American cases. It has happened in also in, in Mexico that they build up a community center, makeshift community center where the older population will stay with all other facilities and they will be secluded from the working age population during the spread of time. When 
my my point is lockdown is the price you are paying to buy the health infrastructure so lockdown cannot be the solution for combating the spread so during that three months four months time you build up your health infrastructure you increase your uh, uh, ventilation capacity so even if some older populations they get affected they can be saved eventually so building infrastructures buying time for that matter you are going for lockdown lockdown should not be any kind of a strategy to combat the spread of the disease it's only for buying time that's my response thank you and i think that also answers shweta lahiri's question because shweta asked is this shielding of elderly at all possible in our country? If yes, how this can be prescribed? Can you shed some light? I think yeah. you, so just I already that uh, you just answered make, that on Makeshift make, make, make sure Community Center incentivizing household uh, to follow that guiding, uh, follow that. So, I mean, see, even if you have a, a infrastructure, you may not exercise that infrastructure but to protect that unless you have an incentive compatibility condition. So, I mean, there is a lots of experimental studies uh, shows that if you can incentivize the household, right? So then you are, as an individual, in a comprehensive lockdown time, uh, government is expecting from an individual a kind of a altruistic attitude to save the community. In a strategic lockdown situation, government would expect an altruistic attitude to save his or her household member. Now, the study shows that when an individual is under a, a constrained situation when he needs to show altruistic behavior, that becomes more functioning when uh, the individual is confined within the household. That's a pure microeconomic analysis, but from the policy part, I can say that the makeshift arrangements and also incentive compatibility and also you know it is it may it may sound like a bit crazy in indian context but in african context where there is a more of a community feeling they like a, a same households all older people start living in a community setup and then secluded young people are providing the ration but what you are doing with a complete lockdown basically without setting up any infrastructure, the lockdown is synonymous to unlockdown. Thank you. Uh, before going to the next question, some uh, good comments I must say. One is from Vijit Roy. Uh, he, he write quite a thoughtful paper and delivery. But how can we ensure this study gets the right attention from the government? So he wants that your letter should or your paper should go to the government. Another very interesting thing. I, I, I have a quick quick response for that particular note. On the day when our paper on Atto Nirvar Bharat uh, published in Ideas for India, it was tweeted by, you will be happy, all, all happy, that the, the Secretary of Revenue, Government of India, tweeted this study with Ministry of Finance and the PS of Nirmala Sitaraman. So they retweeted our study showing that how this macroeconomic expenditures is going to, uh, I mean, it's a futile attempt. So, I mean, we as an economist can raise this point, but I mean, this is an, just an information that it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was observed by some policy people and it was widely circulated and retweeted many times our study in Ideas for India. Yeah. Thank you. That's a, that's a great news. Uh, it is a great to know that your paper is already being in the hand of the government. Also, another very interesting thing you must be appreciating that Taposhi Vishesh ma'am is listening to your presentation oh. and she just wrote that she's enjoying your presentation and she said uh, it's really she's enjoying. Oh, uh, thank you, madam. For your resourceful presentation, Taposhi Vishesh ma'am wrote, thank you, Subhashit, for your resourceful presentation. Now, uh, there is another question from Monjuri Khan. She is, she is writing, as the health facility is not improved enough in our country, mainly in rural areas, then what should be the government step in this pandemic starts growing fast among poor and rural areas people? How to reach the rural area where the infrastructure is not that strong? Yeah, so this is a relevant question now, but in the first three, four months, the prevalence of the disease was almost insignificant in the rural areas. 
we let the disease to go to the rural areas but not providing an enough policy uh, uh, regulations at the urban areas because this disease is highly related with the mobility and economic prosperity, right? If you see the global map of the spread of the disease, this disease in the initial period, the past three, four months, only concentrated in a, in a, in a significant manner uh, in the regions of the world which are much mobile. So rural sector could have been avoided if we had a policy in place to restrict the disease in the urban sector. But when it's reached to the uh, rural sectors, again, the policy would be the same. Uh, at least from our economist point of view, we don't really want to keep the economy shut and then provide anything because keeping the economy shut in a country like India, where there is no safety net in place, you are actually attacking the public in a doubly manner. One is through, through, through disease, another through uh, uh, your starvation. So that cannot happen anyway, right? So the, I will be taking the last question, Shubhashi, here now because it is already 6.21. Our next speaker, Dr. Bhakshar, Bhaskar Goswami, is waiting for a long time. So the last question is from Shurobhi Kaur Roy. She is asking, what lessons can India learn from Vietnam, which is a lower middle income country? What strategy Vietnam has followed to speed up the COVID-19 testing? So what we yeah. can learn from Vietnam? Yeah. So straight away, Vietnam health expenditure is 23% of the GDP. India's health expenditure on GDP is something little over 1%. So you have to invest less, much less on Rafael and other defense expenditure and straight on health and health and education. That's the, as simple as this stuff. I think that that is the straightest uh, arrow you have thrown. So um, thank you, Shubhashish. Uh, now I think thank it you. is time. Uh, to say first, I must say sorry to Bhaskar Goshami for keeping him waiting for such a long period of time. Uh, uh, Shubhashi, it is really enjoyable. So let me introduce now with the permission of our head, Dr. Indani Mitro. Let me introduce Bhaskar Goshami as early as possible because he is waiting for quite a long period of time. And uh, we will be waiting for your lecture, Bhaskar. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Bhaskar Goshami. Dr. Bhaskar Goswami currently is Associate Professor in the Department of Economics at the University of Bardwan. As a student of Department of Economics, Calcutta University, he has obtained his doctoral degree under the guidance of Professor Shoman Shikdar and Professor Ranojendra Nath, uh, Narayan Nath. His interest area relates to macroeconomics, development economics, financial economics, Dr. Goswami's works have been published in Journal of Economic Integrations, Global Economic Review, Trade and Development Review, Studies in Agricultural Economics, Journal of Economics and International Finance, Financial Innovations, Foreign Trade Review, Contemporary Economics, and also in various edited volumes. He was a member of the team that prepared the uh, several uh, district human development reports in West Bengal. He has a teaching experience of more than six years at undergraduate level and 10 years at the postgraduate level. Today, his topic will be uh, COVID economic crisis, issues and lessons learned. Welcome, Dr. Goshami. Now it is your time. Please start your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shoka, for those nice words. Uh, uh, firstly, good afternoon to all the listeners. Uh, it's my privilege uh, to speak on this webinar. Uh, I must express my gratitude to the principal, ma'am, Dr. Chakraborty, the head of the department, Dr. Mitro, and the rest of the colleagues at uh, at, at your college. And also, it's nice hearing my friend, uh, Dr. Shubhashish Day, after such a long time. Uh, I was quite enjoying uh, uh, his talk. Uh, the fact is that uh, uh, what Shubhashish has uh, deliberated uh, was basically a, a, a empirical work, a technical work. In contrast, I would be going for a narrative, uh, a narrative that uh, that is very close to the ground reality that uh, we have observed on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we have experienced uh, through our life, and uh, through those narratives, I would try to uh, bring out the issues at large. Uh, uh, in general and particularly in indian context then uh, i would try to uh, shed some light on 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 the 
the lessons that those narratives uh, really teach us uh, and what are the uh, lessons we are going to take it back so without uh, uh, further de uh, delay let me go for the presentation of my slide uh, on please uh, confirm whether the slides are visible or not Salam, can you please uh, take over? I think it's visible on. Still, I cannot see it. Uh, uh, it's coming. Please wait, wait for a second. I, I beg to uh, uh, get some time yeah, it's coming. Uh, it's coming. It's coming. for these technical uh, issues which I am not at all smart in dealing with such technical issues. Uh, oh, yeah, I think it's uh, it's there. In the okay, fine. Thank you so much. Okay, 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 fine. So uh, basically, uh, uh, I would be speaking on the narratives uh, uh, of, of this COVID, uh, of this COVID uh, crisis, economic crisis, and my talk would be, would be divided into two distinct phases. First, I would be uh, uh, taking up the issues at large in general. Then I would be focusing these issues in the Indian context. Then I would be taking up some few case studies uh, which which uh, highlights the uh, lessons or 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 the lessons that we must uh, we must uh, uh, go for uh, to to tackle this COVID pandemic situation. So uh, first, uh, the issues. The issue uh, is that this particular situation uh, is uh, is unprecedented in the uh, in the sense that it's a combination of both the health crisis and economic crisis. In fact, uh, if you if you go for the ca causal relationship, the health pandemic come first and the manifestation of health pandemic in terms of what uh, Shubhasri has already said, the lockdown uh, to tackle the minance of this health pandemic, the, the lockdown, the strategies of uh, complete comprehensive lockdown did to uh, take a, a serious toll on the economic uh, uh, activities of the countries across the globe. So uh, this combination of uh, the health pandemic and the economic crisis uh, is, 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 is very unprecedented in the history uh, of mankind. So uh, this is a very interesting case that we have in hand. The second is that the speed of the spread of this contagion disease is too fast and uh, uh, too fast in the sense that it resulted in a global crisis at a record time and one perhaps one possible reason uh, to account for this uh, speed of spread is because of the integrated world that we live in right now uh, prior uh, we did have a uh, health pandemic we did have some economic crises of great depression and so on and so forth but those were the times when the world was not integrated in terms of uh, movements of goods and services across the borders but uh, today as uh, as we stand today uh, we live in an integrated global village uh, uh, where where the cross borders uh, transactions of goods and services are are very very fast and uh, this might be an, uh, a reason why uh, the contagion of uh, this covid 19 uh, was very fast and lastly the, the issue that is very interesting is that uh, being a student of economics, if you follow any economic crisis, so that crisis did originate either from supply or the demand side. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, in in terms of in, uh, in times of Great Depression, the uh, the crisis originated from uh, the demand side. The demand deficiency part of the uh, of the economy accounted for the Great Depression uh, sort of crisis. But in contrast to that, uh, here we have a. a, a a uh, marriage of uh, of crisis coming both from the demand and the supply side so both demand and the supply shock uh, operating at tandem in, in the present si uh, situation and and uh, which comes first and which comes later uh, i'll come to that in a uh, very uh, short while from now in uh, well i'll speak of the indian context uh, uh, how this uh, uh, demand and supply side of the indian economy are uh, getting mixed up and creating a snowballing effect on the Indian economy. So these are the issues at hand. But uh, having said that, uh, one caveat is that uh, uh, still the issues are unfolding each and every day. 
as of today we don't have a complete picture of of the of the entire uh, devastating effect that this pandemic or the economic lockdown has uh, caused to the indian economy or the indian society at large so each day each day new issues are coming up and we are we as a uh, researcher in social science uh, we are uh, coping up with this issues we are using issues but uh, uh, to have an in-depth analysis of entire scenario that we are facing right now uh, we need to wait for another two or three years when the entire pandemic uh, gets over normals uh, normality prevails in the uh, global situation uh, then uh, it would be appropriate to go for an in-depth analysis of uh, of what of what this covid pandemic has really cost us in terms of life or livelihood, whatever you may say. So uh, now focusing on India, what I intend to do is that uh, 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 the, the first incidents of uh, COVID-19 uh, surfaced out uh, in early June uh, 2020. Uh, so uh, if if you if you call that to be a structural break in terms of the technical word, uh, I would I would like to walk five years back from 2020 that is we start from a pre-covid era uh, uh, of 2015 and and see how the uh, economic uh, uh, condition was uh, was prevailing at that particular five years down the line uh, uh, five years before the before this uh, covid pandemic uh, broke up surfaced out and 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 what is the covid post-COVID situation from 2020 onwards, what would be the uh, policy response uh, to mitigate the crisis and what would be the lessons and uh, how to look forward. Uh, so this is my uh, narrative from the Indian perspective. Now, as they say, chronology is very important. So uh, uh, chronology is So we need to focus on the chronology. Uh, so the chronology starts from 2015 when our GDP was uh, was uh, was uh, at seven percent, and by any world standard, maintaining a maintaining a GDP growth rate of seven percent was quite uh, fasc fascinating, and it, it was by any standard uh, a good achievement. But in 20, uh, 2016 there was a policy induced shock in terms of demonetization the currency ban and uh, and and after that uh, period uh, uh, the gdp growth rate started to have a uh, uh, decline started to decline in the indian context as if demonetization was not enough in 2017 we had an implementation of goods and services taxes and that according to me and some of the critics was implemented very fast and in a very hastily manner uh, the business sector was not aware or of this uh, of this uh, uh, shift in the tax regime they was taken uh, backfooted by this uh, shift in the tax regime so again uh, that was a shock for the indian economy particularly to the small business sectors and uh, as a result of which uh, the gdp growth rate uh, uh, again went down and uh, in, Jan in Jan January 2020, as we all know, the COVID-19 first surfaced out. And so uh, prior to Jan January 2020, we have a situation in the post-demonetization situation, uh, a periods of demand deficiency in the Indian economy. As, and as you know, the, the demand deficiency in terms of a simple aggregate demand and supply side would mean the aggregate demand curve was shifting downward. So this was the period where the aggregate demand curve was shifting downward. Now, to tackle this uh, COVID pandemic, uh, our central government announced for a nationwide comprehensive lockdown uh, on March 2020. Now, what lockdown did is that uh, it, it, it caused a disruption in the supply chain of the economy. That means uh, the, 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 the business sectors were completely shut down. The formal sector went for an entire lockdown. The worst affected were the informal unorganized sector workers. Uh, it would be uh, it would take another day of a uh, webinar to speak on the uh, plights of this uh, unorganized sector workers. Uh, anyway, I leave the leave up the temptation of uh, raising these issues. Let me uh, let me uh, let me straightforward go to this chronology. 
so a uh, supply side uh, shock was was what was injected in the indian economy as a part of of tackling this covid 19 uh, pandemic situation and post march 2020 we now have a supply shock that means aggregate supply also started to shift downwards so in in the initial phase of of prior to the lockdown situation there was a periods of demand deficiency now after the lockdown was announced it was a period of uh, demand deficiency coupled over uh, supply shocks uh, so there was was a disruption in the supply chain of the economy and 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 as we all know there was an announcement of fiscal package by our finance minister uh, uh, of 21 lakh crore rupees which uh, uh, shubhashi has partly uh, touched upon in his deliberation whether that was uh, 10 percent or actually one percent of the gdp uh, i'm not going into the debate of uh, those uh, data uh, what i intend to uh, speak right now is that about the fiscal package well uh, all the uh, experiences of all the countries suggest that they went for a fiscal stimulus package in contrast our finance minister went for a uh, so-called within quote unquote uh, a fiscal package but i would term uh, it not to be a fiscal package rather than uh, a loan package uh, a loan mela uh, 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 aimed at uh, the corporate houses the business sectors and so on and so forth and 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 uh, and simultaneously our central bank the rbi went for a cut in the rate rate of interest uh, was uh, was offering easy loans uh, such that uh, uh, such that uh, they felt the business uh, would uh, come to uh, the normal situation but here my take is that in a situation of uncertainty uh, where uh, the very question of tomorrow is uh, questionable uh, no matter how much loan you offer at whatever low rate of interest simply the business sector is going to take up those loan and sit on idle cash because there is no market because there is no market for their product so uh, uh, at, at any undergraduate students of economics knows that one of the very important uh, factor of investment is uh, business environment and the, uh, the uh, apart from rate of interest and other factors so if uh, there is a pessimistic business environment uh, no no fresh investment project is going to come up no matter how much loan you offer them at whatever reduced cost you offer them simply they would be sitting on those idle uh, loans on those idle capital funds and they would be taking up fresh investment proposals so uh, the package the so-called fiscal package was basically in the indian context a loan package for the aimed at the corporate business houses the medium uh, small business sectors have nothing to do with the arm admi uh, apart from uh, apart from some uh, few stray uh, incidents of offering uh, rations uh, the foods uh, through the vulnerable population uh, which according to me is not sufficient because still today we see uh, there are a number of community kitchens run by different ngos and different political parties and people are queuing up in those uh, community kitchens to get the food so if had it been the uh, ration uh, the food available to the ration subsidized ration shop was uh, enough there would not have been uh, such long queues in those community kitchens so uh, uh, what i feel is that uh, the uh, food package uh, and the food available through uh, the ration is not sufficient as of now the government need to think much more beyond that so uh, what is the possible solution now uh, the possible solution uh, as my earlier speaker shubhashis has rightly pointed out the the first is that we need to uh, tackle the pandemic curve we need to flatten the pandemic curve we need to uh, we need to put an arrest uh, to the ever increasing uh, contagious spread of this disease uh, uh, so that is the first priority right now we are facing the second would be uh, to flatten the economic recession curve uh, to go for a cure in the economy uh, in terms of uh, uh, bringing back the economy to normalcy uh, 
the normal condition as of now just a few a few days ago uh, we all know that our economy has shrunk by uh, 23% uh, and uh, so so there is a huge huge uh, uh, contraction in the economy i don't know uh, uh, what would be the what would be in the mind of the policy makers to overcome such a such a contraction in the economy but i do have some suggestion uh, which uh, uh, which i like to share with you all and the third uh, part uh, of the solution is to uh, flatten the financial distress curve because after any crisis uh, what uh, what crises uh, uh, do is to uh, is to pinch the pocket of every household so, so uh, every households get a pinch in their pocket uh, uh, in terms of mic at micro level as well as in uh, macro level so the Uh, the banks and the financial uh, sectors are uh, there would be uh, uh, non performing asset piling up uh, the non uh, non repayment of loans and so on and so forth there, there would be uh, jobless uh, there would be unemployment so everything has a pressure everything adds up to the pressure on the financial sector so flattening of the financial distress curve in the long run uh, would be a, 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 a possible solution and how to go for those uh, solutions uh, tools that we have at uh, at our disposal are first health and so social protection so we need to protect our uh, citizens we need to protect our citizens through uh, through such uh, social infrastructure like health and as uh, health and education and so on and so forth now uh, one interesting thing that i uh, i was observing uh, about my earlier speaker's talk was that uh, the stringency stringency index for india was 91 point uh, 97.1% so india did follow a very stringent lockdown uh, comprehensive lockdown but nevertheless uh, uh, the the uh, the incidence of covid uh, was still rising and it's still rising uh, as, as i'm speaking today <clears throat> so what was the aim of the lockdown there was basically two aim of the lockdown number one one is to uh, uh, stop the contagion spread of the disease that's not definitely number one and the second objective of the lockdown should have been to bridge the gap between available health infrastructure and required health infrastructure now this required health infrastructure the policy makers uh, did not have in their mind so uh, they as a as a possible explanation of what shubhashish was uh, speaking that india went for a stringent lockdown and was keep simply sitting idle on it uh, and thinking that everything would be taken care of by following this uh, lockdown stringent lockdown but that was not so that is not supposed to be so because uh, this interim period of the lockdown should have been devoted to uh, to build up uh, the medical facilities to train up uh, to build up uh, the medical infrastructures and so on and so forth uh, at a war footing basis but that did not happen in the indian context and uh, might be that is the reason why we still see an ever increasing uh, uh, incidence of covid-19 so uh, that is the tool num number uh, one that uh, india really missed out uh, uh, and we are very unfortunate for that one the second tool that is uh, uh, that is at our hand is the fiscal policy and we all know what we uh, mean by fiscal policy the government should come up uh, should uh, uh, increase its expenditure uh, should should also try to uh, uh, compensate uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the workers who have lost their job uh, in in the period of the lockdown because uh, here i have a very important and very uh, um, solid argument uh, uh, in our constitution we have a, a right which is known as uh, a right to property the fundamental right uh, uh, w one of the one of the right is that uh, if if you own a land if you own a house and if if government wants to construct a, a, a public infrastructure let's say railway and it uh, it needs your land or house the government needs to compensate you because that's a fundamental right guaranteed by our uh, constitution 
similarly as a corollary to this the life uh, the right to livelihood follows from the life uh, right to property so when government announced this lockdown millions and millions of informal sector work lost their livelihood lost their means of uh, earning so now the responsibility of compensating those jobless workers really rest on the government and this has been the case for the advanced developed countries for example the uk uh, uh, where shubhashri is right now sitting 80% of the uh, of of the uh, of the workers who have lost their job uh, 80% of their wages are bared by the uh, the government exchequers. The rest, 20% are bared by the private uh, firms. So, if uh, capitalist countries like uh, UK and uh, and other can do it uh, through cash transfers, why not India? And and for that, uh, the obvious thing is that uh, the question would come: is that where India don't have such uh, so so much amount of money? Therein comes the monetary. Uh, policy, the importance of monetary policy, where uh, where the uh, the central bank can print money uh, without borrowing, without uh, without uh, having to uh, look at uh, uh, the inflation scenario right now. They can print money, supply those money to the government. The government can give it to those uh, jobless workers as wage compensation of lost job due to COVID. Uh, so uh, these are the tools at hand, and we overall. What we need is a holistic approach, uh, uh, a sense of dignity uh, among the policymakers that uh, the, the person who ultimately lost their jobs due to this lockdown are no one, uh, are not are not any outsiders. They, they haven't come from China or Pakistan or they are not, uh, they are the fellow citizens, the fellow Indians. So uh, a sympathetic view, a holistic approach towards those uh, uh, migrant workers who have lost their job is, uh, is a call of the day. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we did not uh, uh, see much progress in that uh, respect, uh, which is very unfortunate one. So basically, these are the tools at hand. Uh, these are the issues that we have uh, facing right now. And uh, let's turn on to the lessons. Uh, now, the lessons that we learn, I would be, I would be uh, taking up two case studies of two important countries. One has been slightly touched upon by my uh, co-speaker, uh, Shubhashish. Uh, it's a country named Vietnam. Now, the interesting point of Vietnam is that it shares the largest international border with China. That means uh, the China, the ground zero of this uh, coronavirus. Yet, the incidence of COVID-19 in Vietnam is minimal. Now, one thing has to be uh, kept in mind is that uh, Vietnam do have very close uh, uh, international trade ties with China. Still, uh, what uh, 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 after this COVID-19 uh, surfaced out, uh, the incidence of this uh, COVID in, in Vietnam was very, very minimal. Now, what are the reasons for it? Number one, the reason is that uh, the Vietnam, as you know, is a mixed economy. However, the government has very, very strict control over the economy. It's a, it's a mixed economy, but government really owns lot, lots of state-run enterprises do, is, uh, is there functioning at Vietnam. So, uh, what does it mean? It means that if a gun, if a gun, uh, if a government has a control over over the economy, if if the government has a central uh, uh, planned economy in the government is very strong, what the what the government can do is to is to uh, allocate resources at 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 uh, at a very quick at a very quick time and in a very uh, desired direction. So that was the, uh, the, the, the advantage of Vietnam. Uh, so uh, another interesting thing is that uh, the Vietnam uh, uh, relied on, on, on a very simple premise of prevention uh, is more cost effective than, uh, uh, than, than cure of this COVID-19. So Vietnam in the initial phase of, of, of uh, went for a very exhaustive lockdown 
and and uh, since it was uh, the government has a very tight control over the entire economic and the social uh, sector uh, the lockdown was very stringent in vietnam and 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 the, and the fight against covid mainly prevented uh, mainly relied on prevention rather than cure now uh, the hdi human development index is is 0.69 which is quite a very good uh, uh, according to the world standard and just as my uh, uh, this uh, subhashis was saying uh, the budgetary allocation in the health sector of vietnam is 20 uh, is 20 percent or something like that uh, whereas in the indian context it's uh, below one so uh, that is one of the reason uh, why vietnam uh, the covid uh, incidence of covid was minimal in vietnam another very interesting fact why uh, the uh, why vietnam was very successful is that uh, you see vietnam has a very uh, rich legacy of fighting with enemies okay so uh, when this Ma'am, I think uh, connection lost to each other. Uh, let me contact. Uh, hello, everybody. Probably we have lost control uh, the, of the connections. Uh, Vashkar probably is out of the program. So let me call him and then I see you in a short span of time. Thank you. Hello. 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 I have just contacted Dr. Gushami. Uh, yes, he has lost his connection and he's working on it. Maybe it will take 20 to 30 seconds. Please bear with us. Yeah, I'm audible. On, am I audible? Yes, Vashkar, now you're audible. Please you start the presentation. Yes, okay, Vashkar, okay, you're audible you. now. You are back. Okay, thank you. Th thank you. Sorry for the technical glitches. Okay, uh, so I was speaking of uh, Cuba. Uh, so Cuba, as you know, is by and large a, a planned economy where uh, it's dominated by uh, the government enterprises. The HDI is quite impressive. Uh, the, the Cuba government... Uh, puts uh, a huge lot of emphasis on budgetary allocation on social infrastructure like health education and so so on and so forth and, and this country can boast of uh, very trained and highly professional medical professionals and the medical infrastructure in this country is uh, very impressive now uh, when when countries like cuba gives a very high emphasis uh, on its social sector the dividend uh, of those in uh, of allocation budgetary allocation starts to pay off at times of crisis this is what we are seeing uh, uh, of cuba right now 
and if you look at the uh, look at the uh, data uh, the graphs clearly indicates that cuba have effectively uh, flattened their uh, pandemic curve uh, and is on the verge of declaring no pandemic zone uh, covid uh, 19 uh, pandemic zone uh, as if this is not uh, sufficient uh, the the cuban government did send its medical uh, highly trained medical professionals to some parts of europe uh, uh, as as a mark of uh, as a mark of a gesture of brotherhood uh, for those uh, worst affected areas of europe so uh, these are the cases of uh, uh, vietnam and cuba and they have fantastically managed this covid-19 situation and uh, one common thing among them is that both are uh, uh, run by uh, uh, the policymakers who have uh, socialist inclinations. So what are the lessons that we uh, derive out from this uh, success stories? Is that uh, the role of the government, according to our uh, economists, uh, we social studies, uh, we uh, those who deal with social uh, studies, is uh, there is a dichotomy uh, uh, in terms of the role of uh, a government. Uh, in fact, when when we the going is good, people advocate for a laissez-faire economy. That means uh, minimal government control, no government in the economic activity. Uh, everything should be private, privatized. Let there be profits. Let there be sales revenues, so and and so forth. Uh, uh, so that is the time when uh, people advocate for uh, uh, for less minimal government intervention in the economy. So when the goings are good. But at bad times, the same set of people, the same set of critics acknowledge the welfare role of the government in functioning of the economy. That means when, when we face a crisis, it's at the time of crisis, we really, really feel that the government has a positive welfare role to play in. And... Uh, if you, it's not this present crisis. Uh, if you think, uh, if you talk of subprime crisis when the Lehman Brothers uh, went bankrupt, it is the it is the government who came to bail out those uh, big corporate houses. So, uh, at times of crisis, we really feel that the government has a positive role to play in the economy. So, this is the uh, uh, borderline of of the lessons that uh, uh, this COVID nineteen has uh, has gave us uh, gave us uh, to uh, think of to ponder of uh, and i think the audience are going to uh, think of it and uh, in contrast now let me let me focus on the indian active cases you see it's uh, it's uh, sky, it's rising it's uh, skyrocketing the active cases in india uh, it's well below uh, well above 80 80000 plus if you look at the total coronavirus death in India, uh, it's it's well about uh, 80 plus as of as I'm speaking today, and 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 the worst part of it is that uh, uh, our policymakers think it to be an act of God, uh, and, and 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 this is a very unfortunate part of the story of my presentation that uh, 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 our policymakers. Uh, 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 feel that banging thalis or writing deals are going to contain uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, however, uh, uh, this is not the reality. We missed out the opportunity of using the lockdown effectively to build up uh, the medical infrastructure. We missed out uh, on the issues of uh, dealing compassionately with the migrant workers. Uh, we missed out. Uh, 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 we, we, we tend to put the entire blame of economic recession on COVID, which is not true, which is absolutely not true. Uh, the recession, uh, if, you, if, you, if anyone if, says that the recession is just because of COVID, I beg to differ, it's not because of COVID. Indian economy was facing a recession-like situation prior to COVID. What COVID did was to increase the manifestation of this recession in a many fold times so uh, blaming covid as 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 only re reason for recession in the india is i i would be saying it's a myopic sense it's a big drama on the part of our policy makers now finally the lessons i'm uh, i think i am running short of time uh, the lesson is that uh, i leave this uh, slide for the audience to read uh, 
what we have witnessed over the last few months across the globe is that the advanced capitalist countries like UK, USA, Germany, uh, whatever countries that comes to my, your mind, you think of, they are very I think Dr. Goshami has lost his connection. So let me contact him. I'm coming back to you. Sorry for the inconvenience. Give us 20 seconds, please. I have just connected Dr. Goshami. He is coming back. Actually, his uh, internet line is giving some disturbance because of, of the weather, maybe. So, he is coming back within 20 seconds. I request all the audience, all the participants to please bear with us. Maybe 15 to 20 seconds, he is coming back and he will start from where he has left. Thank you so much.
Hello, I'm audible right now. On. Uh, welcome back, Bhaskar. Now we can hear you and see you. Probably okay, the fine. line is disturbing. Uh, it's okay. You carry yes. on. I'm I'm extremely sorry uh, to the organizers uh, because of these technical glitches. Uh, uh, in fact, I was I was speaking of my own uh, when On said that you have been disconnected. Anyway, uh, On, can you please tell me where I was? Uh, you said that uh, the the most sufferer is our capitalist country. The capitalist country. You are actually talking about the capitalist country. That even being a capitalist country and rich country, those people are actually suffered loss. Whereas, uh, a, a, a okay, okay, last okay, slide where they are actually showing you. Okay, fine, fine. Meeting. I I got it. I I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. Uh, the fact is that uh, what. Uh, the fa uh, the fact is that uh, if you if you look for any capitalist country whether it's uk usa germany so on and so forth uh, those countries have come out the government of those countries has come out uh, with a bailout package for the jobless workers in fact the wages uh, of those uh, of the uh, of the jobless workers due to uh, due to lockdown uh, are, are borne by the uh, government exchequers of these countries uh, so this has been the global phenomenon uh, across a uh, 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 global phenomenon. Uh, unfortunately, in the Indian context, uh, we haven't seen any such type of cash transfers, uh, cash transfers uh, to compensate uh, the workers who have lost jobs just because of a go government uh, dictated policy of lockdown. And this is a very unfortunate part of the story. Uh, and 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 uh, to wrap up. Uh, I would suggest or I would say that it's high time and that countries like uh, ours uh, give focus uh, more on uh, the social infrastructure build up like uh, health and education uh, without going for too much of emphasis on 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 uh, on, on the wares uh, the uh, the pseudo wares of uh, between our uh, uh, among our uh, neighbor neighbor uh, countries Okay, so instead of focusing more on defense, uh, as uh, Shubhashis has rightly pointed out, uh, there is a lot of scope for government to go for uh, improvement in social infrastructure because uh, at this type of crisis, we only feel uh, the lacuna or, or the plight of our public health infrastructures that we are right now facing. So, uh, had it been the government of successive years in India did uh, did give em give emphasis on this uh, medical uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, might be we should have been a better position uh, of tackling this COVID nineteen. So, with these few words, and uh, again, I'm sorry for a frequent disruption in in in, in the internet connections. Uh, I end up and I look for uh, the, any questions from the audience. Over to you, Onang. Thank you, uh, Bhaskar, uh, for your enlightening uh, lecture. Yeah, there are some technical glitches, but that happen when we actually conduct seminar over internet platform. This is not entirely your fault. Now, uh, with the request, uh, with the permissions of our head of the department, Indrani Mitro, I request Shubhashish Dashgupta, Dashgupta sir to conduct the question and answer session for Bhaskar Goswami, Dr. Bhaskar Goswami and after that I will request our head of the department Dr. Indani Mitro to give the vote of thanks. Over to you Shubhashish. Thank you Anantu sir. Uh, uh, thank you so much uh, Bhaskar sir for a very enlightening and informative session. Obviously, there were some questions. There are some questions, and with your permission, sir, I would like to start. Uh, the please. first question is, uh, sir, am I audible to you, sir? Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Okay, sir. The first question is coming from Sonju John Mondol. He asks, sir, what is the recent GDP of Vietnam? I'm not getting your question, sir. What I'm is not the or... recent? What is the recent GDP of Vietnam? This question has been asked by Shonju John Mondol.
I guess there is again a technical glitch and uh, sorry for this inconvenience. Yes. Network is very weak. Uh, all of the participants. Okay. Is, uh, okay. It's getting connected. Uh, Bhaskar, Dr. Bhaskar Goswam just informed us that it's getting connected. His network is giving him some problem. So yeah. he's coming back within uh, 20 seconds. It is getting connected. Sorry for the inconvenience. Hello, hello. Yeah, I'm yes. there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are there. Am I audible? Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yes, yeah, you yeah, are sir. Please. Yes. Uh, okay, sir. The first question was from Shonju John Mondol. He asked, sir, uh, what Vietnam is the Philippine. recent GDP of Vietnam? It's seven seven percent roundabout uh, in in two thousand eighteen or nineteen something like that. I don't recall the exact uh, uh, as of twenty twenty. Next one, yes, please. Sir, the, sir, the next question is from Professor Shurovi Kaur Roy. She, she asked you, sir, do you think that India needs to adopt universal basic income UBI program to revive the economy? Yeah, uh, uh, there has been a lot of debate regarding universal basic income. Uh, 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 there are proponents of it. There are critics of it. What I, uh, my standpoint right now is that uh, we do need an universal sort of basic income, a targeted universal basic income uh, to the workers who have lost their jobs, uh, especially the migrant workers, uh, the workers, workers of the unorganized sectors, uh, because they are the most vulnerable uh, uh, right now. So uh, uh, universal basic income targeted to those section of the people is a welcome move to revive the economy, because as you know, uh, the driver of Indian GDP is private consumption and uh, private consumption comes from uh, the rural uh, population of, of our country. So if the rural population, uh, the purchasing power of the rural population uh, keeps on increasing, there are chances that the economy would revive, uh, 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 revive in a short while from now. Thank you. Next one, please. Okay, the next question is from Pallavi Julasoya. I guess I I, I pronounce okay, it properly. Whatever may be the name. Uh, please. Uh, sir, what's your viewpoint on the virus being used as a biological weapon to slow down the emerging economies? <laughs> That's a very funny question. Uh, I don't think it's a biological war going on. Uh, I think uh, there can be no doubt that it's a genuine uh, case of coronavirus uh, surfacing out from uh, a province uh, from China. So uh, these are some negative thoughts uh, which come to our mind, uh, but I can assure uh, the audience that it's not a biological war uh, waged by China uh, to, the, to the global counterparts. It's, 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 it comes 
with time every every century we witness a type of pandemic or something like that so uh, rest assured it's not a biological one please the next question is from professor indrani mitro she asks okay. you what what are the uses of recommending policies if government does not have the intention of implementing them the first part of the question goes like this the second thing is government declared railway fare to the migrant workers but none of them got government asks the employer to give them compensation compensation income but not monitoring it government does not by, did it by itself give any monetary assistance to them uh, government does not try to make database for them okay that's true uh, the fact is that uh, in the indian context let me come uh, from the last part of our uh, question in the indian context what we witness is that uh, there has been a lot of suppression of data uh, yeah, uh, there has been a lot of suppression of data over the couple of uh, few years of this uh, government's rule. Even uh, data that uh, come up, uh, uh, the leaked data that comes up in the public domain are op often dis uh, disputed, uh, disputed by the government officials. So there is a, a problem of data uh, uh, handling in the Indian context. That's uh, the different part of our question. and and. Uh, the first coming to the to the first part of a question is that uh, it's seriously the uh, the intention of of the government is questionable uh, because uh, if the government has the intention of doing a particular thing like for example cash transfers whatever may be the uh, difficulty ground real uh, ground difficulty uh, the uh, the government can think of a modus operandi of transferring those cash to those jobless workers but uh, the very intention of the government uh, is questionable because uh, uh, at least there has not been any try from the government officials to come out with any sort of package uh, to these uh, jobless workers in the unorganized sector so uh, that's very unfortunate uh, as we stand today thank you uh, so the, uh, I guess the, the last uh, question is from Swantani. Sir, what's your view on India's post-COVID scenario in the educational sector and employment in the organized and unorganized sectors? Okay, you see, uh, Sir Anthony, I'm not a prophet. <laughs> okay, I cannot forecast anything uh, when the normal situation would uh, would likely to prevail in the Indian context or in the global context, but I do have very, uh, I do take a very firm uh, ground that unless and until uh, there is a vaccination uh, uh, amongst the population, uh, the situation is not going to uh, be normal uh, that we have been used to prior to this COVID-19. So we need to wait for uh, the mass implementation of uh, vaccine of this COVID-19. Then only we can think of a normal situation. Unless and until a vaccine uh, comes up, uh, we we cannot uh, dream of uh, our past days uh, getting a normal uh, shape. Uh, that's number one. Number two, in terms of educational sector, well, uh, there would be a, a huge discrepancy in terms of rural-urban divide, in terms of online uh, education facilities, which is unwanted uh, for, an, uh, for a country like ours. Uh, so uh, that is uh, very detrimental for, for, for uh, the overall demographic uh, uh, situation of India. And as in terms of employment in the organized sectors, you see uh, uh, the organized sectors employers are uh, don't uh, are not yet uh, facing the heat of this recession. Uh, the uh, the heat of the recession uh, are directly on the uh, employ uh, on the organ uh, workers of the unorganized sectors. Uh, so uh, they are the most worst affected part of the population and we need the government need to think of them thank you uh, okay sir but, sir there are uh, there are some uh, questions there are a few questions also i know that we are running short of time but uh, it's a shower of questions that i will take the last one please don't quit us wrong because we are running short 
uh, what should be the government's possible step to overcome the ongoing recession in our country? Uh, this will be the last question, sir. Uh, well, uh, uh, ongoing recession, you see, it's uh, it's not because of COVID that I have just emphasized on. It's because of uh, the uh, of government's uh, policy, deliberate policy prior to the COVID, uh, where the slowdown was uh, signaling itself, was very much uh, uh, there in the economy. And uh, uh, a blow was, uh, added blow was given by this COVID. So India was facing a, a recession-like situation uh, prior to COVID and COVID dealt uh, a final blow to this recession. The only way out of, uh, of, of, uh, of overcoming this recession is that we need to spark up, uh, we need to uh, ensure uh, the purchasing power of the people. We need to see that the people do have cash at hand and they can go for markets. Uh, I think, uh, uh, okay, uh, so uh, first is uh, there should be a demand stimulus uh, in, in terms of uh, transferring cash to those vulnerable sections. The purchasing power should increase and when such things increases, uh, it would automatically take care of the supply side. As of now, we have a supply constraint Kenshin equilibrium. Okay, uh, we, we know Kenshin equilibrium is a demand constraint type of equilibrium, but uh, this COVID-19 situation uh, is, a, is, is, is it's a peculiar in the sense that it's a supply constraint Kenshin equilibrium. So we need to overcome the demand deficiency first and that would take care of the supply side of the economy. And in, in, in the process, we can overcome this crisis situation. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, we all would like to know this. The question is, when is your next seminar? Please share that detail. Uh, okay, thank you. Sure, sure. sure uh, but uh, the... first, uh, sure, I'll, I would be glad to share that. But before that, I would be firing my internet boy today because of these technical <laughs> glitches. Uh, I'm very <laughs> much curious. It is beyond your uh, control. Beyond your... No, still, uh, still, uh, still, I mean, uh, this is very unexpected. Uh, I do understand uh, that it's beyond my control, but uh, it's very unexpected and uh, really. Uh, 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 and we are now at the end of the session. I, the last assignment lies with me that is, vote of thanks. I must convey my thanks to the two eminent speakers of this uh, today's international webinar that is Dr. Shuhashish Day of Warwick University and Dr. Vashkar Bhushami of Bardwan University. We are really enriched by their studies, thought provoking, and they have lent us deeper insight into the experience of India with under the pandemic and the lessons learned over that issue. Next, I must thank our principal and the IQSC coordinator who extend their help in organizing this international seminar. I must acknowledge the relentless, untiring effort of our technical moderator, Dr. Abdul Abul Salam, for making this webinar a reality. I thank all my departmental staff without whose cooperation this webinar is not possible and last of all but not the least i thank all the participants who have come to attend this who have attended this webinar because as in the market demand and supply they meet at each other to make the market uh, successful running of the market here to make a webinar really successful we need the speaker we need the audience and thank you all for attending it thank you on behalf of Erambo thank you ma'am thank you so much thank you dr goshami so having said that last thank week, you thank you, dr. thank you thank you dr mitro uh, thank you dr salam thank you shubhashish uh, 
uh, having said that ma'am so we are at the end of the program so we can end the program take at once again thank you everybody thank you